Space, Above and Beyond is an American science fiction television show that originally aired on Fox, created and written by Glenn Morgan and James Wong. Originally planned for five seasons, it ran only for the single 1995–1996 season, due to low ratings. It was nominated for two Emmy Awards and one Saturn Award. It was ranked 50 in IGN's Top 50 Sci-Fi TV Shows, described as yet another sci-fi show that went before its time. Set in the years 2063-2064, the show focuses on the wild cards. Members of the United States Marine Corps Space Aviator Cavalry, 58th Squadron. They are stationed on the space carrier USS Saratoga, and act as infantry and pilots of SA-43 Endo-Exo-Atmospheric Attack Jet Hammerhead fighters. Topic. Plot In the years leading up to 2063, humanity has begun to colonize other planets. Lacking technology that would enable them to travel faster than light, also known as FTL technology, colonization is accomplished by taking advantage of transient but predictable, naturally occurring wormholes in space, which allows them to traverse vast distances. Without warning, a previously unknown alien species, the Chigs, attack and destroy Earth's first extra-solar colony and then destroy a second colony ship. The bulk of the Earth military forces sent to confront the Chigs are destroyed or outflanked, in part because the Chigs have some form of FTL, affording them greater freedom of movement although this technology appears limited, and the Chigs also primarily utilize natural wormholes. At the opening of the show, the Chigs have defeated all counterattacks, and have entered the solar system. In desperation, in proven and under-trained outfits like the 58th, wildcards are thrown against the Chigs. The wildcards are the central focus of the series, which follows them as they grow from untried cadets into veterans. Although the unified Earth forces come under the control of a reformed United Nations, the UN has no formal armed forces of its own and therefore navies such as the U.S. Navy and the Royal Navy operate interstellar starships. Prior to the events of the show, there was a war between humans and android artificial intelligences known as silicates. These human-looking androids, referred to as walking personal computers, have rebelled, formed their own societies, and wage a guerrilla war against human society from a number of remote bases. The silicates are also suspected of having some involvement with the Chigs. In an attempt to defeat the silicates, a new underclass of genetically engineered and artificially gestated humans were bred to quickly swell the ranks of the military. These troops, collectively known as in vitros or sometimes, derogatorily, tanks, or nipple necks, are born at the physical age of 18, and trained solely for combat. In the post-war period the tanks have attempted with mixed success to re-enter human society. <laughs> <laughs> Story arcs Space, Above and Beyond connects episodes through several prominent story arcs beside that of the main arc, the Chig War. In an approximated descending order of significance, these are Topic. Chig War 2063. Chigs sometimes referred to as glyphs are a fictional alien species in the science fiction television series Space, Above and Beyond. Chig is not the species name for itself, but rather a human-coined nickname referencing the Shigo flea. Background Chigs are humanoid, bipedal aliens that serve as the primary antagonists in the series. They appear to be unable to survive in atmospheres that support human life, they are often seen wearing armored life support systems that provide them with the methane they need to breathe. 
In addition to providing methane, Chig armor suits also have a built in suicide mechanism that is triggered when the helmet is forcibly removed, quickly dissolving the Chig inside. In the episode, Choice or Chance, a Chig is apparently able to take human form and interact with other humans in an ordinary atmosphere until killed, when it turns to slime in the manner of earlier Chig deaths. How this is achieved is not explained. Distinguishing characteristics of the unarmored Chig are small black eyes set deeply in the head, pink skin, a lack of a prominent nose, a protruding upper jaw, and structures resembling gills to either side of the mandible. The series provides little concrete evidence about the Chigs until the last two episodes, choosing to initially present the Chigs as a traditional science fiction alien enemy out to destroy humanity. Throughout the series, the writers provide several small clues regarding the nature of the Chigs, their motivations, and their biology before devoting the last two episodes of the series to revealing the possibility that Chigs and humans are a related species. Historias the series presents it, known human contact with the Chigs begins when an unmanned probe, launched by the military-industrial corporation Aerotech, lands on a celestial body designated, Celestial Body 2064K, later given military designation Anvil, the single moon orbiting the Chig homeworld. This moon is sacred to the Chigs because it is where life originated via panspermia and where Chigs still go to be born. The Chigs actually evolved from bacteria that originated on Earth billions of years ago. An asteroid collision threw these bacteria into space, carried by meteorites, where they eventually landed on the Chig sacred moon. Life on Earth had already advanced to the eukaryote stage of development, and the rate of evolution proceeded slightly faster for the bacteria on their new world, allowing life there to evolve to the point that it could produce the sentient chigs at roughly the same time that modern humans evolved. The Aerotech probe manages to obtain a limited amount of data before the chigs send a warning signal through it before destroying the probe. Aerotech, for unknown reasons, apparently chooses to keep this first contact a secret from the governments of Earth. In early 2063, Chigs declare war on humanity, launching what appears to be an unprovoked first strike against humanity's budding interstellar colonies. These colonists, sponsored by Aerotech and designated the Vespa and Telus colonies, are attacked and destroyed and the few survivors are taken prisoner. The Chig space forces begin a push straight towards Earth, devastating the unprepared Earth forces. Only the actions of the U.S. Marines Aviator 58th Squadron at the Battle of the Belt prevent Earth itself from falling the battle was actually fought in the Trojan asteroid field at Jupiter's Lagrangian point, not the main asteroid belt, through the element of surprise, superior numbers, and their advanced technology, the Chigs gain the advantage in early battles. Humanity's adaptability and ferocity catches them off guard. The Chigs, who favor large direct military strategies, are unprepared for the guerrilla tactics used by the human forces. Special operations missions, infiltration, assassinations, sabotage, and small unit engagements all prove effective against the Chig attackers. The Chigs then enter into an alliance with the remnants of the Silicates, a human-built race of androids, that fled to space after losing the AI wars on Earth. The exact nature of this alliance is vague and not expanded upon in the series. Just as humans are ready to conquer the Chig homeworld, though, an emissary comes to negotiate for peaceful relations. The emissary reveals that humans and Chigs seem to have a common origin, based on their chemical makeup. Technology Chig technology is slightly more advanced than human technology at the beginning of the series, though only loosely, on the scale of a few decades of advancement cf. how Nazi Germany had better weapons technology than its enemies at the start of World War II, though mostly because it had been economically focused on military weapons development for several years. Chigs have faster-than-light spacefaring technology and advanced weapon systems. 
In the show, they use a combination of plasma-based energy weapons and ballistic missiles for their aerospace fighters and capital ships. CHIG ground forces use anti-gravity hover tanks, designated T-77s for heavy armor and anti-personnel plasma weapons and flamethrowers. Study of downed CHIG fighter craft in early episodes revealed that they are faster and have a better rate of climb than their human counterparts. However, human hammerhead fighters have a heavier weapons loadout, and are more maneuverable. The Chigs also possess large battleships and a destroyer-class vessel capable of causing energy spikes within human starships' reactors using a specialized microwave energy weapon generator. They also developed a stealth fighter with a hull impervious to standard aerial cannon fire. They also have a red-colored fighter that can travel across the gravity field of a black hole. Culture much about the Chig society and culture remains unknown throughout the series, presenting them as mysterious and therefore terrifying alien enemies trying to destroy humanity. Their specific command hierarchy and general social structures remain unexplained. From the Chig ambassador's claims in the final two episodes, it seems that they consider the moon they evolved on, codenamed Anvil, by humans, to be sacred. In some sense, one curious practice observed since early in the war with humanity was that whenever Chig infantry encountered the grave of a dead human soldier, they would dig up the body and mutilate the corpse, typically by completely dismembering it. At first, the human military thought this was a terror tactic, meant to frighten human soldiers with the Chig's brutality. As the war progressed, it was eventually discovered that while the Chigs may possess some form of religion, given that they consider their breeding grounds to be sacred, they never developed a concept of an afterlife. As it turns out, humans are just as much mysterious, terrifying aliens to the Chigs as they are to humans. As the Chigs encountered snippets of human culture, through intercepted radio transmissions or recovered personal effects from dead soldiers, etc., they drastically misinterpreted this alien concept of an afterlife. This led the Chigs to believe that dead human soldiers will literally spring back to life sometime after their death, and that burying a corpse aids this process. Genuinely terrified of this human army of zombies. Chig infantry then began to dig up the graves of human soldiers they came across and completely dismember their corpses, to make sure they stay dead, just as humans have applied the derogatory slang nickname, Chigs, to the aliens, they have their own derogatory slang term for humans. According to their silicate allies, the term loosely translates as, Red Stink Creature. Chigs have green instead of red blood, and smell like sulfur. As it turns out, humans' red blood and non-sulfur smell strikes the Chigs as just as disturbingly unnatural as their alien biology seems to us. Chigs of note. Chiggy von Richthofen. Named after Manfred von Richthofen. Chiggy von Richthofen. Flew an advanced Chig stealth fighter, with the words. Abandon all hope, written in English on its hull. Its armor was impervious to standard cannon fire and was a superior vessel to Earth fighters and destroyed dozens of them. Chiggy von Richthofen was killed in a dogfight against Lt. Col. T. C. McQueen. McQueen used missiles to breach the armor of the fighter. Chig Ambassador, a Chig envoy sent alone and putatively unarmed to the USS Saratoga to negotiate an end to hostilities between humans and Chigs. It was equipped with a translation device capable of producing English. The Chig attempted to explain the circumstances of the Vesta and Telus colony massacres, blaming Aerotech CEO E. Alan Wayne for desecrating the sacred moon of their homeworld with an unmanned probe. When Wayne refused to admit to the act, the Chig attacked him, resulting apparently in an explosion that killed him, Wayne, and several top Earth military officers. Whether it was a hidden bomb, an emergency resort or an assassination device, or the mixing of methane and oxygen exploding after a gun fires, is never clarified. <laughs> <laughs> 
Topic: In vitros. As artificially gestated humans, the in vitros do not share social equality with the so-called naturally born, literally removed, born from their individual gestation tanks at physical age of 18, they are educated swiftly and harshly to enable them to enter society with at least a nominal idea of how to comport themselves. They are derisively termed, tanks, by regular humans, which seems to be a double entendre, describing not only their method of birth, but also their physical toughness, which is always greater than, naturals and the disposable nature of them, the first to come in battle, the tanks, that open the way for the infantry. Unfortunately, due to their limited amount of emotional development, their deployment in the AI war as troops was not as successful as the pioneers of the in vitro program nor the military would have liked, as the in vitro battalions had no emotional connection beyond the most basic to their country, planet or even race, this led to their racial reputation as lazy and not caring for anything or anyone. Episode 1.01, 1.02, which contributed to the prejudice against them from naturals. In vitros also seem to refer to themselves as tanks amongst themselves. Before its abolition, they were subject to indentured servitude episode 1.05, and there is still considerable racial segregation and resentment by normal humans e.g. episodes 1.01, 1.06, and governmental abuse for morally dubious purposes episode 1.13. Two main characters, Cooper Hawks and T.C. McQueen, have to face all the ramifications of such a society from their perspective as in vitros. This repeating theme explores topics such as racism and prejudice in a society, and also freedom. It differs from other story arcs in its complexity in the form of a division into two substories. One is presented as historical narration by the characters e.g. episodes 1.05, 1.18 or flashbacks episode 1.13, the second occurs in the present, with the experiences of Cooper Hawks and T.C. McQueen, including a subtle substory of the shifting relationship between Nathan West and a maturing Hawks e.g. episodes 1.07, 1.11. Topic. Silicates Silicates are a fictional race of androids created by humanity to be servants. History The silicates were created to be servants and soldiers, however, they developed an intelligence and sentience of their own, after they were infected by the take-a-chance computer virus created by Dr. Ken Stranahan name from the show's visual effects supervisor. This sparked an AI rebellion by the Silicates, who attempted to free themselves from human rule. This long war continued for many years, until the Silicates captured military spacecraft and escaped into space. As they went into space, the Silicates suffered from a lack of maintenance which caused problems for them. The remnants of the silicates that fled into deep space serve as mercenaries and actually aid the alien chigs in their war against humanity. Capabilities The AIs artificial intelligence were manufactured by humanity to serve them and, as such, appear as humans but with enough differences to appear as machine creations, namely the rifle sight like crosshairs in place of pupils. They were made to be beautiful and physically appealing by their makers. The surviving silicates that fled into deep space have been suffering from a lack of adequate maintenance for many years, and thus frequently possess minor damage to their outer covering which reveals their machine parts underneath. Silicates were primarily designed to be domestic servants, or even pleasure slaves, and not particularly for hard labor which would be done by heavy machinery. As a result, standard silicates are actually not that much stronger than a human, and because they were not originally designed to be used in combat, it is not particularly difficult for a trained human soldier to defeat them in hand-to-hand -hand combat. 
This is partially offset by the fact that silicates are not hindered by physical pain, and cannot experience the emotion of fear. Silicates communicate with one another through modulation schemes made by wireless telephone which comes across to humans as a series of electronic beeps and chirps. This wireless network allows each AI to know the position and operating status of the other units. Their mechanical nature allows them to store information and retrieve it making them excellent in information gathering which can be shared with their colleagues when demanded. Behavior As the AI silicates were created as a «servitor» species, they were programmed to understand abstraction, but with programming that restricted original thought and creativity, which leaves them to simply imitate rather than create. Had the «take a chance» computer virus not been created, it is likely the silicates would have remained within their servant race role. As such, risk-taking has become the prime ideology of the AI silicates which results in them seeing activities as a risk or gamble. The first, risk, was the indiscriminate killing of their human creators in the AI war, which lasted for ten years. The silicate robots refer to humans as, carbonites, because they are carbon-based life forms. Because the silicates were programmed to comprehend abstract thought, but also restricted from formulating original thoughts, and do not normally possess emotions, such as fear, the silicates are capable of understanding that humans experience fear, albeit this comprehension is on an academic level. This made the silicates a deadly enemy in the AI wars, because while they experienced no fear themselves in combat, they realized the value of random and savage attacks meant to terrify and demoralize humans. While the silicates were incapable of originating such tactics on their own, they simply needed to imitate the long history of terror tactics used by human armies. A silicate's inability to experience emotion, as mentioned above, is contradicted by two episodes, one by 18, titled Pearly, in which a silicate displays concern for the welfare of an affection for a silicate that is badly injured, and one x03, titled The Dark Side of the Sun, where revenge upon the protagonists for the death of another silicate is attempted. The emotional capability of silicates is never explored by the series, so it is unknown if these displays of emotion were out of character, or the intentional development of character types. It is strongly implied that the AI wars were not a primarily «conventional» war, with each side gaining and losing territory, but largely consisted of silicates infiltrating human societies and committing random acts of terrorism and sabotage. Fighting was not limited to front lines, as the silicates intentionally attacked places humans thought they would be safe in order to terrorize them. Shane Vanson's parents were killed when a group of silicates drove into her middle class suburban neighborhood, randomly storming her house. The silicates' gambling centered ideology even extended to combat tactics, they randomly chose to attack Vanson's home as the result of a coin toss. The tide of the human Chig War began to turn after initial Chig successes because Chig battle tactics favor large scale and direct military assaults. The human military switched to asymmetric guerrilla warfare, which the Chigs were not conceptually experienced with fighting. The subsequent alliance between the Chigs and the remnants of the Silicates, who are quite experienced at non-conventional warfare and terror tactics, partially made up for this deficit in Chig strategy. Aero-Tech and the UN The Dark Arrow Tech and UN story arcs inject elements of conspiracy and high-level cover-up. Aerotech, founded in 2015 episode 1 appears to be a monopolistic aerospace and defense supplier. 
It is connected with the UN by Aerotech's clearly evident political power, both with the UN with a former Aerotech director becoming the United Nations Secretary General in Episode 1.06 and with the armed forces, as evidenced by its control over advanced technologies Episodes 1.03, 1.10, 1.16. It is also suspected that Aerotech was aware of the Chigs before the rest of humanity, and deliberately endangered the Vesta and Telus colonists episodes 1 1 Aerotech further gathers, uses or withholds key strategic information in pursuit of its own corporate agenda e.g. episodes 1.03, 1.09, 1.10, 1.11, 1.12, the Aerotech and the UN story arc explores topics such as power, intrigue, politics, the military-industrial complex and perhaps to some degree also the ethics of science in the service of military and corporate interests and moral responsibility. Ending The final episode ends in a cliffhanger, with T.C. McQueen badly injured and most of the major cast apparently killed or missing in action, with only Cooper Hawks and Nathan West remaining. Yet with Earth in a much stronger strategic position, there is hope despite the losses and sacrifices. These closing elements of the plot were written at a point when the producers knew that the show was likely to be cancelled. Topic Episodes Topic Cast and Characters Topic Main Fifty Eighth Squadron AKA Wildcards Kristen Cloak Capped Shane Vanson, USMC, Callsign First Episodes Ace of Diamonds, later changed to Queen of Diamonds. The eldest of three daughters, Vanson was born to two career Marines. Her parents were executed at the hands of a patrol of silicates during the AI war she would later discover on interrogating a silicate that her home was invaded and her parents killed as she and her sisters watched due to a coin toss the silicates adhering to their doctrine of take a chance, EP 1.04 she joined the Marine Corps to honor their memories, and with ambitions to be one of the elite of the 127th Squadron, the Angry Angels. A natural leader, solid tactician and outstanding pilot, she was quickly chosen by her peers to be in command of her squadron in the early days of the Chig War EP and this choice was reflected in her being selected as Hancho by her superiors in missions thereafter. EP During the war, she would repeatedly encounter the silicates, and would demonstrate a cool head under pressure even when facing these nightmares of her child. Childhood, EP 1.04, 1.06, 1.08, 1 1.09 reflecting her war record having been wounded several times in combat, receiving repeated citations for achievement in battle as well as the continued respect of her peers and superiors. First Lieutenant Vanson was promoted to captain in late 2063. EP 1.17 She was close friends with all of her squadron, subconsciously slipping into the big sister role that she had been denied as she and her sisters had drifted apart in the aftermath of their parents' deaths. Morgan Weiser, First Lieutenant Nathan West, USMC, Callsign, King of Hearts, Hammerhead dubbed Above and Beyond, EP 1.01. Arguably the heart of the 58th Squadron, Nathan West had never intended to become a Marine. His choice or career and by definition, lifestyle had been in the TELUS Colony program. He and his girlfriend, Kylan Selena had worked long and hard to be selected for the program, with the kind of strong moral conviction of the truly adventurous. They had also been longstanding advocates of in vitro rights. On the eve of their mission to colonize TELUS, they were advised that one of them was being summarily replaced by an in vitro, a political decision that had ironically robbed them of their dream. 
although Nathan tried to stow away, he was unsuccessful, and was removed from the transport. Kylan stayed on, handing a photo of them together, with a recorded message of I believe in you to Nathan. He watched as Kylan and his life flew away. Having been advised that a USMC sentry might be stationed at TELUS, he joined the Marine Corps, and was halfway through training when the news arrived that the Vesta and TELUS colonies had been preemptively attacked by the extraterrestrial species that came to be known as the Chigs. After undergoing accelerated training, he and the rest of the nascent 58th Squadron participated in the Battle of the Belt, the Earth Foss's first victory against the enemy. First Lieutenant West was credited with six confirmed kills in this space battle. Along with the other members of his squadron, he was awarded a prestigious medal for this decisive victory, EP.1.01, 1.02 Rodney Rowland, 1st Lieutenant Cooper Hawks, USMC, in vitro, callsign Jack of Spades, Hammerhead dubbed Pags Payback, EP.1.01 After being scheduled to be erased for asking a single question about freedom, Hawks subdued one of his monitors and killed him in retaliation. Escaping the in vitro training facility in Philadelphia, Hawks lived on the streets until being arrested while chasing an in vitro racist who had tried to hang him. The judge ordered him to the Marines, where he found the only people he ever cared about, the wild cards. He bonded especially with his fellow soldier Mike. Pags. Pagodin, who was KIA in the early stages of the conflict with the Chigs, and Lieutenant Call T.C. McQueen, who became a father figure to him. Joel de la Fuente, First Lieutenant Paul Wong, USMC, call sign Joker. After growing up in poverty in his hometown of Chicago, Illinois, Wong enlists and is assigned to the Wild Cards. He was especially known for his sense of humor, attachment to the Chicago Cubs and Wrigley Field, and his budding romance with Lieutenant Stroud, played by Melissa Bowen, who later married Joel De La Fuente and squadmate Vanessa Damphouse. Lene Chapman, First Lieutenant Vanessa Damphouse, USMC, call sign Ace of Hearts. Originally from upstate New York, Damphouse graduated from Caltech with a degree in nuclear physics. She functions as the squad's technical expert. She is in a relationship with a previously married man, who is later revealed to have left her for her best friend. She is close to Paul Wong, with whom she becomes romantically involved over the course of the series. James Morrison — Lieutenant Call Tyrus Cassius, T. C. McQueen, USMC, in vitro, call sign Queen Six. McQueen is the commander who leads the 58th. Prior to assuming this position, McQueen has commanded the 127th Squadron, the Angry Angels. The unit was decimated during the first contact with the Chigs, leaving McQueen as the sole survivor. He is a veteran of the AI Wars, during which he was captured and tortured. McQueen is divorced from his wife due to his inability to procreate naturally. McQueen has a strong bond with Hawks, for whom he functions as a father figure. Recurring Tucker Smallwood Commodore Glenn Van Ross, USN. David Jean Thomas, Gen. Alcott, USMC. David Saint James, ADM Brodian, USN. Amanda Doug, Kylan Selena, Aerotech, Telus colonist. Tasia Valenza, First Lieutenant Kelly Ann Winslow, USMC, call sign Queen of Spades. Edmund L. Schaff, Chaplain, USN. Bill Hunter, Secretary General Spencer Shardwell, UN. Robert Crow, Officer Crow, Lieutenant. Pruitt in last episode, USN. Doug Hutchison, Elroy L. A. I. Kimberly Patton, Felicity O. A. I. John Lendale Bennett. 
Master at Arms, USN. Michael Mantell, Howard Sewell, Aerotech, member of the board of directors. James Leisure, Charlie Stone, USMC. Melissa Bowen, LTJG Stroud, USN. Jenny Nevinson, Lauren Chase, Ann West, Angus Grant, Mark Worden, Neil West, Private, USMC in EP. One, O seven. Eva Franks Singer, Sabrine EU AI. Topic: Guest stars. Coolio, the host. David Duchovny, uncredited. Alvin L. Fifteen Forty Three, A.K.A. Handsome Alvin. Silicate. Dale Dye, Capt. USMC, Ret. Major Jack Colquitt, USMC. R. Lee Ermey, GYSGT, USMC, Ret. Uncredited. Sergeant Major Bugus, USMC. Adam Goldberg, Sergeant First Class Louis Fox, Seventh Cavalry, U.S. Army. Steve Rankin, Lieutenant Colonel Raymond Thomas Butts, callsign Kick Butts, and Deuce. In EP 1.05, Raymond Butts, Harriet Sansom Harris. Ambassador Diane Hayden, Secretary General, UN, in EP 1.06, Eyes. Richard Kind, Colonel Burke, in EP 1.14, Level of Necessity. Martin Jarvis, Major Cyril McKendrick, in EP 1.18, Pearly. Ronald G. Joseph. General Oliver Ranford, USMC, in EP 1.20, Stardust. Gail O'Grady, uncredited, Colonel Klingman, in EP 1.20, Stardust. Jennifer Balgobin, Communications Lieutenant Price, USN, in EP 1.21, Sugar Dirt. Topic. Production While drawing comparisons with Robert Heinlein's novel Starship Troopers, and the movie bearing the same name though opposite message, according to the producers, the main fictional work that influenced Space, Above and Beyond was one written in response to that story, 1974 science fiction novel The Forever War by Joe Haldeman. In addition, it was inspired by fictional works, such as the 1948 World War II biographic novel The Naked and the Dead by Norman Mailer, the 1895 American Civil War novel The Red Badge of Courage by Stephen Crane, and The Iliad, and the 1962 television series, Combat. At the same time, Space, Above and Beyond also shares conspiracy elements with other television shows co-produced by the same team, such as The X-Files and Millennium. <laughs> Cinematography and visual effects The series featured a very dark and desaturated color grading, apparently inherited from the cinematography of series such as The X-Files and Millennium, co-produced by the same team, but taken to a greater extreme. The strength of desaturation employed in many scenes reaches the level that makes them almost black and white quantitatively. The saturation in CXY color subspace of a typical scene in space, above and beyond as in the range 0.03 to 0.15, approximately one quarter of a typical contemporary film or television program. With the increasing affordability of computer systems with performance suitable for 3D rendering, space, above and beyond relied heavily on computer-generated imagery CGI for space scenes. Physical special effects still played a significant role. The computer-generated effects of space, above and beyond, were created by the visual effects company Area 51 using NewTek Lightwave 3D. 
Some of the models used, such as the USS Saratoga and the Alien Carriers, lacked detailed textures and bump maps, which gave them a strongly polygonal appearance. Topic music Wang and Morgan were looking for a more traditional musical approach than the synthesizer scoring favored on the X Files. Visual effects supervisor Glenn Campbell introduced the producers to the music of Shirley Walker, who had worked on Batman, the animated series. Wong and Morgan were initially unconvinced on hearing Walker's synth demos, until it was explained that her musical ideas would be filled out by the orchestra. Wong went on to describe the scoring session as his favorite part of filmmaking. Walker scored the pilot and the entire series, receiving an Emmy nomination for The River of Stars, and reunited with Wong and Morgan on many of their later projects. Her final film score was for their remake of Black Christmas. In 2011, La La Land Records issued a three disc limited edition featuring Walker's score for the pilot and music from most of the episodes The Enemy, Choice or Chance, Level of Necessity, R&R, &R, and Stardust do not have any score cues on the album. <laughs> <laughs> Sound effects The sound effects used on the show are often reused on the animated series Futurama. Topic criticism A notable criticism from the actor Joel de la Fuente has been quoted in an article by P. G. Min and R. Kim under the pseudonym Michael, on p. 744, in which he describes his perception of a possibly stereotypical nature of his character Lieutenant. Paul Wong, for which referring to the silicate story arc he felt discomfort for a role that he describes as a cowardly soldier who betrayed his comrades. Topic: <laughs> 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 International broadcasts. Topic: <laughs> <laughs> Other media. Topic DVD release Space Above and Beyond was released on DVD in the United States and Canada by 20th Century Fox as a set of five DVD 10 discs on November 8, 2005. Episodes feature closed captioning, and the set also contains some of the original television promotional advertisements for the series. Certain pressings feature a distorted image of the Babylon 5 space station, which is unrelated to and does not appear in the series. On the disc's title screens, in 2011, Space Above and Beyond was released on Region 2 PAL DVD in Germany by KSM GmbH. In April 2012, Space Above and Beyond was released on Region 2 PAL DVD in the UK by Fremantle Media, Medium Rare Entertainment. It contained a new documentary, cast interviews, some episode commentaries, galleries, and deleted scenes. The pilot episode is included in the full season set but has also been released separately with just a commentary. Novelization There were several books and comic books released based on the show's episodes. <laughs>